Thank you all for coming. We will, um, today we're going to hear from uh, Sofia Lakatska, who is uh, uh, on faculty at the Ukrainian uh, Catholic University in Lviv. Um, she is a founding dean and chair of the supervisory board at the Business School and vice director for implementation of UCU strategy at the university. Um, I've known Sophia for uh, over 20 years now, I think. Um, she has always been a leader there, and particularly since the war started, she's been tireless in her efforts to um, talk about what's going on there and be thinking about, as a university, what they can do uh, in the situation. So I asked her to come in and speak, and I'm really grateful. We've been trying to get her for quite a while now, um, and I'm grateful that she was able to make it. It's easy to forget what's going on with everything going on in the world. It's easy to forget what's going on in Ukraine. And um, I am grateful that she's coming in to put a human face on that. So with that, we'll have some questions at the end, but she's going to start with a brief presentation. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for introduction. <laughs> so I will share a little bit in the beginning. Um, some of my thoughts, some of thoughts which we have in the university, some of our experience, and this is just to set the ground, and then we can have a Q&A session, and, um, and it can go in different directions. So for all Ukrainians, it's, it's about two years plus two weeks. And in a way, you can look at this time frame from different perspective, because you can look at this as a very long time frame, frame and very devastating one. But what helps us a lot when we think about that we are two years and two weeks closer to our victory. And that's the perception a lot of Ukrainians try to keep and uh, in their minds and try to uh, remember. Uh, but if we think seriously, it's not about two years. It's okay. It's about ten years. And um, uh, about ten days ago, um, there were a lot of rallies, and we are very grateful uh, for all of them all over the world. So I found that um, rallies took place in 746 cities across 69 countries, and that's a great support for us, and we are very uh, thankful. And I know there are probably people who participated from this room in such rallies, so please keep doing that. That's important, and we uh, truly appreciate that, because sometimes you could, you could really feel that you are left alone. So yes, this is about 10 years, and I think, um, I think if we don't want to continue for another 10 years, it's it's a little bit that all of us have to do something, and I will talk about that in the end of my conversation, in, in the end of the, uh, the speech. Um, the experience of war is overwhelming. It's bigger than anyone could possibly process in his or her own, on, on his or, or her own. Uh, when full-scale war broke out, students of Uku were shocked and lost. Uh, some of them were terrified and cried. Too much chaos in human life is unbearable. So you can see on that pictures they are in the, they are having classes in the shelters. So this is how often classes happen now. Um, this black wall it's a beautiful window wall like here, but we have to close it for the safety reasons. And my presentation will be accompanied by sketches of uh, one of our colleagues, Ulyana Krychovec. Uh, she's a young uh, artist. Uh, she indeed works in the development department. So we have, uh, uh, in development de department, we have such uh, very talented people. And over the first year of war, she was doing different sketches to different events. And um, they, they show um, very nice, they show in very, I would say, natural way what we are going through. Um, so, so the Russian war is not a war for resources because Russia has a lot of resources. It's not the war for capturing the cities because when they come to the cities there is nothing already there. They are fully destroyed. French political analyst Nicolas Tanzer believes that Putin seeks no positive goal that we can envision. It's a war of destruction, a new barbarism 
in the 21st century. And I would like to quote, Putin's primary adversary is the law, especially international law. Putinism is unique in that it does not aim to construct an alternative order. Rather, it seeks the systemic destruction of any order." Unquote. Putin does not believe in people's agency. Being an authoritarian leader, he believes that ordinary people are manipulated into actions and are not subjects of their own agency. And I think that we Ukrainians prove him to be wrong. Putin in this war is not just targeting our present, he is targeting our future. Thousands of children from occupied territories were, um, were, were taken illegally, like everything Russia is doing these days, to Russia. So you can see that to return all of them, if we had one child per day, it would take us 55 years. And, and that's only those children we know on the list, because probably we don't know about all of them. More than two million of our children have gone abroad to escape. Russian missile attacks Ukrainian schools, hospitals, cultural heritage, and religious institutions. If you go to the website saveschoolsin.ua, you can go through the uh, QR code, you will see how number of institutions which are damaged and totally destroyed is going up all the time. So I remember I had a speech in Boston um, in summer 2022, and the numbers were about less than half of that, and it's going up and up all the time. Uh, losses in education are huge, both in hard but also soft infrastructure. In the last attacks on Lviv, which is 70 kilometers from the border with Poland, which means NATO, five educational institutions were damaged, two schools and three kindergartens. You can see on that left, uh, left um, picture one of the private schools. Um, their team did extraordinary efforts so that on the next day, kids from that school got back and continued studies. School is something very much cherished in Ukra by Ukrainian children, maybe because it can be taken one day away, or maybe because more than a million children in Ukraine are studying completely online because the enemy is attacking the frontline regions. Amid this full-scale invasion, we see remarkable things. The banking sector is well and alive, and I can transfer money uh, only during the air raid and pay my bills or donate. Trains are running and are coming on time. Um, business is busy, and schools and universities are teaching. Recently, one graduate of our executive MBA program shared with me that the role of Ukrainian business now, additionally to running the economy, is also to help people being busy and productive have a routine of going every day to work and do something meaningful. So woman on this slide um, below, she, her name is Olha Krivchenko. She's our graduate of Executive MBA of 2023, meaning she started her education when we still had COVID and she finished her education, her executive MBA, when the war was there. She lives in Kharkiv. She is owner of IT company, which is still based in Kharkiv, partially. She's very open about that, and she is telling to all of her clients that they are working from Kharkiv. And that's very important for her, because she is saying, if I leave Kharkiv with my husband, but they actually left but came back very quickly back, she says, if we leave, who will stay in that city? That's very important for us young people to stay there. Her offices, she has two offices which were already damaged, but she keeps doing that. Um, the company on the right, Enzim, <coughs> it's a company uh, which produces yeast, uh, which is very important for production of bread. Uh, it is based in Lviv, uh, which makes it easier a bit. Um, in they had a lot of business um, before 2014 in Russia. And the market in, in Russia was growing very quickly for them. Um, it's a family company, except for that factory, they also have production of pet food. And again, the market for pet food in Russia was growing very quickly. But in 2014, 
Then this girl from the first picture was nine. They decided that they're not going to do any business in Russia anymore because they annexed Crimea and because they invaded Donetsk and Luhansk region in Ukraine. So they changed the strategy completely. And um, over the last 10 years, they moved to a lot of uh, European markets. Uh, they are selling in more than 20 countries. And before the war, they started to build a plant. And um, in February 2022, the plant was like uh, biotech, actually. They are moving, they are doing transition to biotech company. And the plant was about five to six months not finished. So when full-scale invasion started, they stopped construction for two week, weeks. And then they continued and they started the plant. They started the factory. Um, they have a great team. Um, and uh, they had to start all the operation because when you have a factory, usually you buy some production lines and um, uh, the company which is supplying the production line, they have to start it. But nobody was ready to come from international experts, from their partners, suppliers, to start the line. So they had to start the line on themselves. Um, so I'm trying to give you an example, give you examples of people doing really extraordinary things, because if you think about would you invest in Ukraine right now, we often hear when the war is over. But I would like to show to you that Ukrainians are still investing in Ukraine, uh, because we believe in that country. Um, so for us as the university, it was very important from the very start of war to bring back sense of control and um, our lives of our students. And yes, you cannot stop the war, but you can contribute to the victory. That's what we were saying to our students. You can work so that each day brings victory one day closer. Uh, designing and keeping this daily schedule becomes a way of regaining some agency for us. Our students engaged in various volunteering activities from humanitarian relief provision for internally displaced people to tracking the damage of cultural heritage to fighting Russia's disinformation war. We also transformed our curriculum to make it more meaningful because you cannot talk about theoretical things in the classroom and then students go out and they see war, destruction, and people thinking about totally different things. So we brought a lot of uh, service learning projects into our curriculum. In summer 2022, we have asked all of our faculty to revise the program, to revise their courses, and to make them um, relevant to the context in which we live. There is a clear sense of ownership um, of the country among, among Ukrainians, and we could say that uh, the whole nation rose united in solidarity uh, for defending the country. A community of Uku has more than 100 people at the front line serving for Ukrainian armed forces. Those would be our students, alumni, uh, family members. I show you, since we are in the business school, those are business school graduates, uh, students. Not all of them are on this picture, but um, at least some of them. So I would like to tell you the story about Konstantin Krikunov, who is on this smallest picture. Uh, he worked uh, for many years for the biggest Ukrainian IT company, SoftServe. And um, because he worked very loyal, he was very loyal to the company. He holded positions of uh, project manager for more than 10 years. He is a graduate of our technology management program. Um, company agreed to give him sabbatical for half a year. So he had the ticket to Bali. And his plane was about to leave on February 24th, 2022. Instead of being on sabbatical at Bali, Kostya is fighting at the places which you know from the newspaper, like Bakhmut. He had spent there about, um, I think, more than half a year. And there is a number of documentaries where he was explaining how they are doing that. And um, as you can imagine, his neither his education or job experience was preparing him for that. Um, some people on this slide are owners of their companies. Are owner they started their companies. And now, while they're in the armed forces, companies are still running. 
So they, had, they have built, built enough of trust with their teams that their teams are running the companies now. Um, small post-Soviet army cannot win against the big post-Soviet army. We need asymmetric moves and a big number of business owners, top managers, middle managers, bring not only their knowledge of technologies, logistics, leadership skills, but also their social capital to the army. They connect easily with other graduates of university or business schools or other business schools. So we are not competitors in this matter anymore. On various innovative projects, and we have many examples of such. Uh, what's important that that's bottom-up initiatives, including innovations, are very natural for freely-minded Ukrainians. And that's what makes us very different from top-down Russia and Russian people. Bottom-up initiatives saved Ukraine in February, March 2022. The volunteer movement was and is spectacular. People crowdfunded resources for everything, food, clothes, tactical medicine, defense equipment, for everything. I can tell you amazing stories about any of these men. We actually have a lot, we have women from university who are also serving now. They are just not on this slide. <laughs> so all of these men, they are from different regions, different parts of Ukraine. Some of them didn't speak Russian, in, uh, didn't speak Ukrainian. They spoke Russian in everyday life before 2022. But they are an example of courage and commitment to their country. And I would like to give you, um, again, through QR code, so you can see Costa here much better. <laughs> you can see his face. Um, and Olana, she's the owner of the company Enzim, which I told before the story. So we made a documentary about leadership um, in such times. And, uh, you can watch it on the website of the on YouTube channel of Ivy Business School because we partner together and uh, with the English subtitles, it's there. You can go through the QR code there. A um, couple of more things which are not related to business but also very important for us. The Ukrainian armed forces care about lives of their soldiers. We witness high morale training versus cannon for the approach, subsidiarity principle, celebrating the return of soldiers from captivity. Ukrainian churches, Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant, serve soldiers for the military ministry of their chaplains who accompany combats in the front line. The Ukrainian public celebrates the stories with human face. Saved animals who happen to be at the battlefield Soldiers who are posting pictures of videos, how they're coming back home and their kids are welcoming them. So humor and fun stories, they also play some therapeutical role for us. There is a huge, uh, I would say, um, growth in different posters, different uh, images, and they are, they are very viral in Ukraine right now. But the same is true about the way Ukrainian dead soldiers are treated. When their bodies are transported through villages and towns, people in the street, streets pay public honor to their selfless service by kneeling. It turns out that death also could be lived with dignity. Any war is a defeat in humanity. Any war is a trial when it comes to protecting human dignity. But even in the context of military conflict of the scale like in Ukraine, the search for human dignity is not a mission impossible. There are many actors who could teach us to affirm human dignity even under such adverse circumstances, even if it is such difficult and costly. Um, I think this year will be defining moment not only for us Ukrainians as a country, but for the whole global order. We Ukrainians often hear, give us new arguments why we should continue supporting Ukraine. The problem is that during two years of Great War, Ukraine used all available arguments. From the point of view of values, world order, international law, and human dignity. If you think about each dimension, they are existential. 
Of course, we can use the supply chain argument and how does our war, which happens in Ukraine, influence uh, wallets of Americans buying, going to Walmart and buying something there. But unfortunately, we cannot repackage and sell the same set of arguments forever. Let me quote a Ukrainian Nobel Peace Prize winner, Oleksandra Matvichuk. You have to imagine the Oleksandra Matvichuk, she Peace Prize winner who advocates all the time for human rights, and now she advocates for giving weapons to Ukraine. That's a completely different angle. The, so I quote him, the problem today is not only that the space of freedom, freedom in authoritarian countries has narrowed to the level of a prison cell. The problem that even in mature democracies, the principles of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights are being questioned. The generations that survived World War II were replaced by others. They inherited the values of democracies from their parents and began to take rights and freedom for granted. People increasingly manifest themselves not as bearers of these values, but as their consumers. And therefore, they are ready to exchange freedom for economic benefits, promises of security or personal comfort. But freedom and human rights are not chosen once and for all. We make our choices every single day. People in the world must understand that neither, neither NATO nor any other external circumstances created an aggressive and criminal Russia. Evil can simply arise in certain societies and find its way into the hearts and minds of people. Such evil will not become good if we try to pacify it through appeasement, negotiations, and market transactions. It is important to realize that rational arguments may not work when you are faced with such evil, and the only resource you have is to fight to eventually stop the bully by force. We, we are in the business school, in the university. So I always say that we are in a generational business, meaning we create the most lasting and cross-generational impacts, perhaps the most important and transformative impact when it comes to human personalities, human lives, social and community lives. One thing which we can't allow ourselves to fail at communicating and educating is this. A free society is a moral achievement. A moral achievement which cannot be achieved once for all and forever. It requires everyone's effort and commitment. It's a kind of moral victory which is expected of everyone and all of us at all times. Thank you and Slava Ukraini. <laughs>
um, to the whole economy system of Soviet Union, which collapsed. Um, so the transition was not easy. Uh, a lot of people started their businesses like exactly in the 90s because they, they, they realized that they need to feed families somehow. So we had um, growth of entrepreneurship. Uh, at the same time, at the east of Ukraine, there was um, a big division of the property and um, um, you could hear such words as oligarchs and uh, that's how some people um, in very, how to say it, uh, cheap way would receive um, uh, rights and property of uh, huge companies. Um, so that's if we talk about the economy, but I think what, what's important to understand is what did not happen in the 90s. So all those processes took place and I think we have, I think we are in a way very competitive environment. Um, there often we know that Ukrainian products and services are really good and they are pretty competitive on international markets, but, but there's another element to that which is not economic but which is and I wouldn't call it political, but it's uh, after the Soviet Union collapsed, um, there was no um, revision of how did it work as an empire because, and how it was continuing the way of Russian empire. Because what makes Russia different from other colonial states is that it collected countries around itself and collected countries with people who look the same, but their language was, um, was prosecuted, their beliefs were prosecuted, and the, I think it was a big problem that we never had this really understanding that um, Soviet Union was an empire and Russia was behaving like empire. So, so if we look on the defeat of Germany in Europe, all those processes took place, but with the collapse of Soviet Union, those processes did not take place, and uh, I think they were forgotten very soon. And so, if you um, I, right before the war started, actually, we had a, another colleague in from Ukraine talking about the transition. One of the things he talked about was that in the early '90s, it was a bloodless transition, mm -hmm. and that he didn't know how that was going to affect what happened um, now, and that. Are you seeing that the result of this war is maybe having a different effect on the psyche and on the, the mentality of um, Ukrainians? Well, the, what happens over already 10 years, and especially now, it has the biggest influence on identity of people. So some people like me from Western Ukraine, sorry. <laughs> For us, it was easy to have our identity because we were coming from families with history, with Ukrainian language. We were on the Soviet Union for one generation less. But for people who were living in east of Ukraine or in Kiev, they could not define themselves. They, they very often, they, for them, um, right now, being Ukrainian, that's very conscious identity choice. So many people are switching from Russian language in everyday uh, conversations to Ukrainian right now because they identify themselves as Ukrainians and they, they believe in values which we as a country are defending now. And that's... Yeah, that's, in yeah. Eastern Ukraine, because right? in Western Ukraine... Yeah, that was for us, it was always much easier. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you talked some about some of the businesses um, and how they responded, and there are some case studies that are coming, gonna come out from WDI as well on some of the businesses in transition. It is remarkable to see how some of them have responded to this. What's what example that's most, most surprising to you? Uh, <sighs> There are many examples. There are companies, I know small company from Kharkiv, they relocated to, they relocated to Western Ukraine, but they still operate in Kharkiv. And before invasion, they didn't think that they are national company. Now they became national company because they have operations in different regions because of relocation. Or let's say some IT companies, they always thought that they would like to be international companies. And they became such in two weeks while their employees were just leaving. So 
I know companies of two, three thousand people now they have offices and if they're employees in 80 countries. So they had to deal with the taxation system in 80 countries. They started to open small offices whenever they had 10 or more people. They still have to keep the culture of the, of the company in 80 countries. So, I mean, or I know people who are, um, they have a production and the, the window glasses are broken totally and they keep running the production and they have to make a decision to put the glass or to, for millions, which can be done tomorrow, <laughs> or to, to do something different to keep the production. You also talked about the students a little bit. Yes. Um, tell us a little more about what, so what's happened to enrollment, mm -hmm. but also uh, the attitude of the students and, and their approach to education. Uh, business school students. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we are executive level business school. So we have people who are come. We are, we are saying that we have two criteria to our students. They need to have experience, and they need to have a desire to reflect on that experience. Because if they are sure they are doing everything correctly, no need to go to the business school. Uh, so we last year we indeed had a spike in the enrollment, and it was surprising because. It turned out that um, that um, since we have a lot of middle and top managers, uh, those are mostly people 30 plus years old, which means they usually have families and they, the way how they operate, they would go for business trips, business conferences to the clients. So you cannot, if you're a male student now, if you're a male in the country, you cannot go abroad you're not allowed to go, you, you need to have a special permission for that. So you don't have business conferences, you don't have trips to clients, you don't have, uh, you cannot go to study abroad. Um, and often your family is abroad. So a lot of people decided that they would like to spend this time on education. So you have work and somehow helping country, either, either volunteering or donating. Um, so a lot of people decided that they want to spend this time for their development and we had uh, the enrollment last year was very good in the business school. Uh, this year it was as well. Um, what, what changed in their expectations and in what we tried to do, I think people became much more reflective. Um, for them it's not, imp it's not just important to have formulas and uh, spreadsheets and case studies and understand how business can become better. I think people are looking now answers for very deep questions. So including um, they want to know more about history of the country to understand. Uh, they want to know much more how they can build, build companies with a human face. So how human being is in the center of their businesses. So I think in that way, um, we are doing a lot, of, uh, a lot of work in the curriculum at the um, so intersection. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. And cases, we, we changed a lot of cases. We do a lot of live cases. So we, visit, we visited with our executive and base business of, of, one of one of them, and it was under occupation. And in a couple of, it's agricultural business, and now they are delivering trucks to many European countries. So, and in terms <laughs> of the education changing and being more holistic, as you're describing it, do you think that's going to be a permanent change? Or were you moving hmm. that direction anyhow, or is that something that is yeah. when the war is done? Uh, so being. Part of Ukrainian Catholic University, that was always a direction for us. It was just not a mainstream in the country. So now there is the demand much bigger. So we see, we have Uku online platform and we have different courses there. We have not only business courses, but also on mental health, on, uh, on history. And we see a lot of business people going to courses which have nothing to do with business because I think they want to, to be um, as you say, much, much more holistic people. 
Okay, good. So let me move on then to something that's sort of related, some questions. So um, thank you to those of you who posted questions online. Uh, we have a couple that have to do with faith and business, so I'll, mm -hmm. I'll group them together. Uh, how practically were you uh, applying Christian values while managing a business school? And how did your Catholic affiliation influence the way, uh, the way you view the work you do in the business world? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think for us as the university, a human being has always been in the center. And that was the whole wor word of community. What is very, it's something what you would hear from every graduate of the university and of the business school. Um, when we started in wonderful 2008, I, I assume you remember what happened in 2008. That was the wonderful year to start business school because two lines in the budgets of the companies which were deleted immediately was marketing and education. So we survived 2008, and, um, but, but why I say that is that we are the only Catholic university in Ukraine, and even on much bigger territory of uh, post-Soviet Union. Um, so for the first five years, I was always explaining how come business school can be a part of the Ukrainian Catholic University. And you also have to know that church was prosecuted in Soviet times. So um, for us, a lot of people from church who, they, who kept their faith over decades, they're a great example of leadership as well. Um, so after five years of explaining how come business could be in the Catholic University, I think we found this society started to understand that, that probably this business school again is a bit, a bit more than just instruments. Because if we talk to our students and graduates, they come for the instruments. They want their business to be much better every Monday after they have been to school on Friday. You know, that's, that's how it works. We all want to, to, to make it much better fast, quickly. But I think over the process and time of studying and being with us, they start to value much more of their intangible things, like relations, like, um, like how do I treat my employees? And that's also was a big thing in the beginning of full-scale invasion, because you have to, to realize that some companies had employees in where the, the war started immediately. So there was so many, so many efforts from businesses, how to evacuate people, how to bring them to safe places, how to give them um, uh, meaning means for survival. So people were not working at some point, but, but they have been getting salaries from companies because, because they needed to organize their life. So that focus on employees in the beginning of full-scale invasion, I think it shifted a lot of thinking of uh, top managers and owners of the companies. How pervasive is that? Is it, so we've had conversations with other faculty at other schools who also talk about the fact that they come to school for the skills when they get there, they're looking for something, soft skills or uh, morals or trust, um, yeah. something along. How pervasive do you think that is throughout other business schools? In Ukraine? Yeah. It became, it became something very interesting as a part of value proposition, as they say, because, but we have been the first school to do that when, because it was not so popular five years ago. We were just, other schools were talking much more about business, but now it's, it's coming from, it's coming from students, from clients. Okay, good. Um, a couple other questions on how do universities adjust to times of war? Uh, one which is how have universities in Ukraine navigated their mission to provide an education for young people with the military recruitment drive? Is enrollment in Ukrainian universities lower than it was? Two yeah. Years ago? So the whole overall enrollment is lower, like 25 to 30 percent, of all over like the, the whole country. Um, as I mentioned, two million children are of different age are abroad, and the longer uh, invasion is taking place, the least possible that they will be coming back. Uh, though there are cases when young people said, no, I would like to come back and study in Ukraine. 
um, again, the, the, there is a matter for young uh, men because if they start university in Ukraine, they, after being 18 years old, they won't leave the country, which limits their opportunities for mobility, for international experience. They, they are in the country. So we are doing different, um, different formats how to bring this international experience virtually to them. Um, it's a big difference how to do business or operate educational institution in east of Ukraine where you have the battlefield close and on west of Ukraine. Obviously we adjust it as much as possible and for us it's very important to have students on campus. So like we are in this room, we have all classes in um, on campus. Um, we, we made campus as safe as possible, which means all underground rooms are being used as the classrooms. Whenever we have an air raid, we go, uh, but this room would be shared by four faculty members in different corners probably, <laughs> because there is no enough space for everyone. So I also say that uh, when the air alarm is on, people from the park are coming or from the streets. They come also to the university, to, to, to the downstairs, to the basement. So they can join for free, you know, some classes and can participate in the discussion. And um, I mean, in a way, it's, it sounds funny, but sometimes we think maybe we can do more <laughs> this way, you know, <laughs> engage people. So you remember, Paul, because you have been on our campus, we have tax department close to the university. So we are joking that maybe we are doing extra efforts to educate people who are working in the tax department as well now. <laughs> you know, that thing I've heard for companies too, that they, in some sense, started doing more because of the war. They've, seen, um, they've opened up in different things that they weren't anticipating. Yeah, so, so in a way, education, it's not just about education now. We had got a lot of corporate uh, programs, and I think for companies, it's about well-being of their employees. Because if you think, if employees go to executive education program for a couple of days, they are in normal setting with less air raids in the west of Ukraine than on the east. They can um, talk to other people. So it's, this, this is what I had in my speech, this normality. You really need this normality. So this is part of the we are thinking that maybe that's a combination of not only education, but of well-being programs for, for the companies now. And echoing that, of the companies, the case studies that I've been looking at over there, every single one of them, the first thing they did was say, how do we take care of our employees? Yeah. And what do we do to, make, to keep paying them and to keep yes. them safe? Um, another question related, how has the war impacted alumni relations and institutions? How is the university yeah. So alumni, that was a huge, huge moment. So, so if you were, if, if your company or your person, you personally were part of some business association or part of some community, it was much easier for you to go through those most difficult times. A um, couple of reasons for that. And that's not only because you would seek for some business advice from your colleagues, but because you could do much more together. So, since we have a lot of graduates as owners of the businesses in the beginning, maybe I will tell you one story to show it. So one of our graduates, he was uh, leading military administration in one of the regions. So on the first days of war, he gets the, I would say order, because that's a military administration. It's like regional administration, but now they are military. So he gets the order to transport very special military um, equipment or um, vehicles to Kiev region because there was an attack on Kiev region. So he called another graduate of the business school three o'clock in the morning and said, I need your help. And the, the other graduate, he, has, he produces the um, special transportation systems for those um, not typical vehicles. So three in the morning, um, the other one makes changes in the routes, finds people to drive, 
those um, transporters and the, the yeah that's how it works I mean I think this example that's the best one in a way because um, it was publicly spoken at our annual alumni meeting by those uh, two people but um, we had in the beginning of invasion we had a spreadsheet in which we had all our alumni and what their business is about and how they can help you and we opened that to everyone um, and they were just getting in touch with each other any time of the day or night when they needed. And people were picking up the phone from each other. No voicemail messages. All right, I'll ask one more that was uh, put online and then we'll open it up to the audience. Um, what is your mental model to approach challenges? <laughs> to sleep? <laughs> Sleep is very important. I have to tell that in the beginning of war, you can ask any Ukrainian, we didn't sleep. I, I think I slept, that was the least I slept in, in first two weeks, or maybe three weeks, uh, so to sleep. Um, to go, we go out. So, um, so my husband is now part of Ukrainian Armed Forces, but before he had to leave, we went on Friday to the theater. I said, we are going to the theater, because that's part, how, how do you keep your normality in, in this situation? Um, take care of children. I mean, children put things in order. <laughs> it's very, very important to keep the order for yourself and your children. Yeah. All right, questions from the audience. I don't think I need the mic. Uh, oh, it's it's recorded. recorded. Oh, yeah, right. it's taped. Um, much of what we do in this country presumes the availability of a reliable internet. Mm -hmm. What has the internet been like in Ukraine since the war? It's actually much better than in many developed countries. <laughs> So as I said, um, so there are, there are a lot of there is a lot of equipment which helps with that, and especially um, while we had a lot of blackouts, that was important to have such an equipment in the house or in the university. Uh, so again, companies at that time they could take care of those things because they had more resources and they could buy generators and echo flows for that. And people were using or companies and the company spaces um, as hubs for that. You know, people, families were coming with kids studying to the office because office had lightning and um, electricity and it had uh, internet. And um, yeah, so it's it's really good. I would say we had uh, the only case we had uh, one mobile operator was down for a day and a half. It was uh, pretty scary somehow, but I think uh, Ukrainians learn how to adapt quickly. So another mobile operator had sales up like 50% on that day because everybody went to buy uh, um, cards of, of the other mobile operator. And they actually were not ready for that, that their sales will go so quickly up. Um, yeah, so with the internet, it's, it's I would say, um, Soldiers have internet in the trenches always, or often, not always, but often they have, yeah. And that's, so one of our university graduates, uh, but the team, they organized a foundation called uh, Ziga, Ziga Spa. Ziga, that's the name of her dog. So, and their focus is on high tech equipment to the soldiers. So they are, for example, providing a lot of equipment so soldiers have um, connection. Thank you. Yes. Another question. This might be a messy question. Um, and, um, I assume that before the war, there were many businesses who had relations with Russian businesses. Yes. Were there business, Russians doing business in Ukraine, Ukraine, you know. Ukraine. Before 2014. Yeah. Oh, before 2014, so you had it, okay, because I was going to ask, how did that become untangled? You know, especially when the war began. So yeah. from 2014, that was already kind of 
Well, I don't. Well, I think some companies were still having business, but those companies who made this difficult decision in 2014, because as I said, Russian market it's it's a huge market, yeah. and a lot of companies were doing business there, and you didn't have to put super extra efforts to promote your products there. Um, those who made those decisions, they were in much better shape when full-scale invasion started. But I would like also to mention that there are more than 350 American companies which are still doing business in Russia. And some of them are saying that they are providing essential goods, like Oreo cookies, or um, yes, or chocolates. I don't find them essential goods. And um, there was interesting situation because PepsiCo, they didn't pull out of Russia. Um, and they have a plant in Ukraine. So their plant was last September, their plant was hit by Russian rocket. So, I mean, you, you make the connection. Other questions? You can start hearing more and more about um, the you know, war is reconstruction. Yes. You mentioned during your talk that we really want to move to that stage quicker or sooner rather than later. What is the uh, Catholic University doing with connecting, say, entrepreneurs with uh, mm -hmm. investors, especially overseas investors? So we have a center for entrepreneurship, which is very active, and we have been supporting startups also in the beginning of invasion because. At that time, all, fu all funds were stopped, um, like seed funds or angel fu uh, funds. Uh, we keep doing that. Uh, we, we will have a program uh, where we take uh, 40 Ukrainian entrepreneurs to Stanford in two weeks, I think, that will be happening. It was rigorous selection procedure, um, so we are doing that. Um, I think in a way for us it's very important to support those who stay in Ukraine and you're right I think uh, if I spoke to you a year ago my talk would be much more about uh, reconstruction and plans for reconstruction but I think we're a little bit cautious now about that because though fast recovery and reconstruction already taking place like companies are rebuilding what they are losing or um, some companies are expanding and not only Ukrainian companies just to give you an example there's a Danish company Yusk uh, they are similar to IKEA to Swedish IKEA so they had in Ukraine 60 stores before full-scale invasion I think they have 80 stores now so so companies are growing but still, with the situation at the front line and with the support, which is delayed for Ukraine, um, we are much more cautious about that now. So, and we also understand that probably it will take longer than we expected in the beginning. And um, we need to learn how to operate, how business can operate in this very challenging mode of not knowing when, when is the end in sight. That's very difficult because if you think, that's what makes um, this type of crisis different from any natural disaster type of crisis. Because if hurricane happens, yes, it's devastating, but you turn the page and you can move on. Here, we don't see the end at sight. So we have to learn how to operate in this. Markets don't like uncertainty. Yeah. Yes. But, but that's our reality, and uh, I think we learned how to do it. So whenever you, your company will be operating in a very uncertain environment, you can invite Ukrainians on the board, and <laughs> they can be very instrumental there. No, I think that's one of the things that's most remarkable, because as you said, it's the end is uncertain, the environment is yeah. uncertain, and yet you see not only Ukrainian companies, but other companies continuing to operate and in some cases, really thriving and doing very well. There's a, a story of a Nova Posta, yeah. uh, the FedEx of, of Ukraine, that many of their customers had moved outside of Ukraine, and so they started operating outside of Ukraine, which is which they weren't planning to do, and they weren't doing before. Um, but that kind of can do and going to keep operating. The ability to operate in an uncertain environment um, puts them in a good position. Yeah, so, so some companies moved where their customers moved, some companies moved where their employees moved. Yeah. Um, well, 
I can say that we love McDonald's now because McDonald's pulled out of Russia very quickly. They did it in proper way. They, 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 they were not telling the stories that they are pulling out and not doing that. Um, they closed their um, restaurants for some time and they reopened very quickly and they have been using the restaurants for also humanitarian support and they reopened and uh, that's an example of the company which uh, which is we appreciate so we truly appreciate who is with us right now and i think we will be very loyal as customers and nation to those who are with us right now but is there any other question out there I, I read a headline, I believe it said that Ukraine is more self-sufficient with energy supply than yes. in previous years. Can you talk a little bit about that? It seems like there are less power outages even after missiles hit power stations. Yeah, it's, I'm not very much expert in that, so I cannot comment uh, much, but I saw also that we, we, we went through this winter much better. Uh, and uh, for Ukrainians, that's another type of, uh, um, it's not military troops, but it's people who are doing all the, the uh, repair all the systems whenever a missile hits. Uh, the, the, these people are also very special to us as, Ukraine, as a nation now, uh, because they're also doing some extraordinary, remarkable things. And, uh, and of course, we, we appreciate a lot that there was a lot of support, at least I know from European Union, to, to make the system more sustainable. Uh, last summer, a lot of things were done in the infrastructure uh, to keep it running over winter. And, and I think we also, though the situation might look a little bit, how to say, disappointing, that we didn't move so much on the land. I think we did a lot of work in the sea, in Black Sea, and it makes our life easier now because the strikes are not so often. They are, we have less of them. They are not, I mean, it, it's already a lot, um, though we don't consider, nobody considers that as a, as a better field, but it is as well. Let me finish with uh, one of the other questions uh, that I'll sort of combine here. What's the best way to engage with your university, mm -hmm. with people in Ukraine from universities on this side? Well, there are many ways how you can engage. Uh, well, for example, you can you can call your senators, Congress people. You can write to them and say that um, well, that we as a nation, we continue to need your support. And that's very, um, I would say that's very urgent topic um, because time is running and uh, we, are, we are running out of, um, of, this, of this support and uh, we, cannot, we cannot fight with empty handed in 21st century. That's not 16th century or, yeah. Um, another thing, um, there, again, there are many ways. Um, um, the way how we cooperate, Uku Business School and uh, William Davidson Institute. Uh, the opportunity just to talk and share with other people. So what you can do, each one of you can tell to three people today that you have been at this talk and you learned uh, such things about what's going on in Ukraine. And, um, and at the same time, we as a country, we need a lot of help, but I would like to convey the message that Ukrainian business is a very reliable partner. And uh, as a business, or companies and organizations, we need also to work together. Um, and um, I think there is a way not only to support us, but the way to learn from us. Because again, a lot of innovation is happening. Uh, mostly now in the military, but which can be taken then to civilian life. And I'm sure that it can be, it is very well tested at the, at the battlefield now, but it can be taken later uh, to medicine, to agriculture, this whole drone movement, which, which is right now in Ukraine. Um, I think there can be a lot of, um, it might sound strange, but from in, even in such devastating situation, we are trying to see opportunities. So, so there are a lot of opportunities, and those who will move fast, and then when then the war is over, will have 
better chances <laughs> to, yeah. Yeah, and I think, um, I mean, you talked at the beginning about the transition, the long transition to the market economy, and it seems like um, there's been a lot of soft transition that's taken place. Yes. Even though, if you look at some of the GDP numbers, you don't see that much growth over the past 30 years. If you look at the way businesses are operating, you are seeing a transition. And you mentioned, it's a huge change. It's a huge change. Uh, one thing that she's mentioned to me a couple times, which is striking, that if you look at the top companies, about half of them are not part of the oligarchs. They're, they're new. Economy. Totally grassroots business, which, which started. Really telling, really um, a good sign for what's going forward. And, and the ability to operate in this market, I think, also bodes well for the future. Sophia, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.